The Perfect Earth Project, next on Environment Long Island. Welcome to Environment Long Island. I'm Carl Grossman, and with me is Edwina Von Gaal, and she created the Perfect Earth Project. Edwina, what is the Perfect Earth Project? Well, Perfect Earth was started officially in um, 2013, although it, it had rumblings for a few years before that. I am um, a landscape designer, have been for a very long time. And at a certain point, I decided that I should really get a little bit more serious about what people were putting on their landscapes. So I started the Perfect Earth Project to promote um, and to promote chemical-free landscaping and to raise consciousness and, and provide education about how you can get incredibly great results without toxic chemicals. And it's been this long-term sort of fiercely held belief in the landscape professional community that you cannot deliver the product without regular inputs of fertilizers and pesticides. And actually, that's just not true. It sells a lot of product, but it's really bad for the environment and for you. <laughs> the Perfect Earth Project has its, its origins and of all places, Panama. Can you describe uh, your, your involvement in Panama and how that led to the Perfect Earth Project? Yeah. Up north in the springs <laughs> in the town of East Hampton. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a roundabout story. <laughs> um, because it, my landscape design business brought me to Panama um, to work with Frank Gehry's office, which was an amazing opportunity, to design the park for a museum of biodiversity that was being built in Panama right at the time that the Panama Canal territories were returned to the Panamanian people. So they had amazing real estate to play with and they wanted to tell a story of their remarkable environment and biodiversity. So I got hired to do that. And in the process of doing it, it was just like a dream for a science geek like me. And I met a lot of people and we decided, a bunch of scientists and I, to start a project to promote reforestation with native species on highly degraded tropical land, particularly the dry forest, which is the world's most endangered forest type. And I wanted to do it without chemicals because I'm a gardener and I have never gardened with chemicals. And I and we're, you're growing native species. Why would native species need chemicals? And yet they were dumping, they were teaching the local people to plant trees using heavy inputs of chemicals. And they couldn't read the labels even, you know, so that didn't really make sense. And people said, you can't do that. And I said, well, I don't see that there's a lot to lose here. And we did it and it was successful. So I, my life as an environmental activist was was born in the dry forest of Panama, yes. Uh, but then my friends kept saying, well, Edwina, like, uh, what are you doing there? Why aren't you here where we think, like, we kind of need some input? And my dentist one day said to me, could you tell me what to do? Because I have waterfront property, and I really would like to cut back on the chemicals I'm using. I, I don't feel good about it. Where do I turn? And I got this little flutter in my stomach that said, oh gosh, this is going to be the rest of my life. I have to do this because there was no place for him to turn. And that was, in fact, an oral surgeon, a dental surgeon. I've gone to Dr. Robert Iovino. <laughs> yes, you're it, right. I mean, he's, he's terrific. doesn't hurt. You know, <laughs> very lovely. difficult jobs dentists give to Dr. I Iovino. Mm -hmm. And he <laughs> sent you, I mean, he, he asked about what he should do with his yes. piece of property. And then how did that, how did the transition work from Panama, the exhibit in Panama, the work in Panama, 
Dr. Iovino and the Perfect Earth Project on Long Island? Well, for a while, I was running both of them. So I started the Perfect Earth by deciding, well, I have to figure out really if this, like, does it work? Like, what, what is involved? How do you um, have a lawn without chemicals and a landscape? So I asked some of my clients if they would work with me on that and if we could try going chemical free. And, um, and at the meantime, I realized this was going to be taking more and more of my time. So I ended up finding someone really fabulous to run the project in Panama. And so little by little, I transitioned north. <laughs> and the Panamanian project has become now a 100% Panamanian nonprofit, which I'm very I'm proud of, especially the young woman that I hired to do it. She went to Yale Forestry. She transitioned. We now have a completely Panamanian board and a completely Panamanian character, which is way better than someone from Long Island telling them what to do. So that has fledged, I like to say. And so then Perfect Earth has come up as a place that working with my clients, knowing nothing at first, uh, I found out, we, we just started out by saying, let's look at what you're putting on your landscape now. And in New York State, you're, the, the, land, the applicator is required to give you a list at the start of the year of everything they're planning to put on your landscape during that year in terms of pesticides. They don't have to do it for fertilizers, but it's probably in your bill because you're paying for it. And so what we found out was that there was really a lot of chemicals going on their properties. Like we had, we, I, I thought, oh, you know, this will be nothing to it. I mean, a lot. And when, you, when we started speaking to people about why, there wasn't really a good basis for it was just because it was what you do and I said well what if we don't and nobody knew so we said okay we won't and and I started searching for the people who had already some experience that I didn't and started to find a few my clients were extremely generously engaged and patient but the the like the world did not end. The, there was really no noticeable difference. And we dealt with problems as they came along. So I met people who were doing um, beneficial insect cures, soil mycorrhiza, the whole soil biome, which people didn't even know much about when this started, has now become a huge part of our knowledge and a real underpinning to the whole process. And, and I had no idea that this laid in my future, and it's, it's, it's remarkable. Like all the stories that people used to say about the soil, and it just sound, it feels right, or like crystals and rainbows, it's actually science now. So that's been, in, it just happened at the right time. Dr. Iovino just, he knew something. And he fixed your teeth too, it sounds. Oh yeah, they're doing fine. <laughs> Let's jump right to the anti-pesticide uh, well, organic soil, non-synthetic fertilizer chase. Now, this is from your wonderful website. Thank you. Uh, excellent. Soft, lush, gorgeously green, perfect for a game, a picnic, or a nap. How perfect? Perfectly toxic. And then you go on. America's 40 million acres of lawns are doused with approximately 250 million pounds of pesticides yearly. Landscape pesticides can, I mean, we're not just talking, well, talking about plants and animals, we're talking here also about people. Uh, landscape pesticides can cause cancer, Parkinson's disease, nervous disorders, asthma and hormone disruption. The chemical lawn is especially harmful to children and pets, and anyone who sits, plays, entertains, or occasionally nibbles on it, 
and, and, and this is so important, and get this, lawn chemicals are totally unnecessary. Right. So that's, that was my big, my, my big aha moment that like we can do this. And there are a couple of things that we do, that you do ideally need to accept as a slightly different product. That isn't to say you can't have like the old fashioned, like military cut um, lawn without chemicals. You can, but that's a lot of extra and unnecessary work because you're asking grass to do something that it's just not healthy doing. So the key is to look at, a, at grass as each individual grass is an, a little plant. So what does a plant need? Plenty of photosynthetic surface, good deep roots, lots of contact with available nutrient, lots of great nutrient, and now we know a healthy soil biome. So what does traditional lawn care do? Reduces the photosynthetic surface to the point where the grass is almost collapsing. Waters sh seldom and often, I mean often and, and shallow, you know, so that the water isn't penetrating deep down. And then people just keep watering like every day, every other day. So that's like spending your entire summer in a wet bathing suit, but like you're never really getting a drink of water. And so fungus diseases, root problems, the roots are all on the surface where the sun's gonna bake them. Sl grubs can easily access them. So all of these things are then treated with more chemicals. Grubicides and, and fertilizers, which stimulate the grass, but that makes it more susceptible to fungus problems. And so it, it goes in a nasty cycle. The thing that we have discovered is how dangerous they are to people. I mean, we're, we're looking at water quality a lot here on Long Island, but mostly focusing on nitrogen. That's another whole story. Nobody's testing for the pesticides. It's really expensive to do. And I figure the practices that get rid of nitrogen will get rid of the pesticides. So it's a win-win. But people always said, well, these are really targeted pesticides. So a pesticide is anything that kills a pest. So that includes insecticides and herbicides and fungicides and rodenticides and everything with side. <laughs> and so, what you have is that this group of chemicals that are targeted for certain, to kill certain things. So people say, well, that's a broadleaf killer. It interferes specifically with a particular part of a plant's growth process. That's not gonna hurt me. That's what you'll be told, that it's not gonna hurt you. Just like Roundup is not gonna hurt you, right? Glyphosates, because they're designed to kill plants. Well, what wasn't taken into account is our, our human biome, which consists of, guess what? Little microscopic plants and microscopic and bacteria and fungi. And all of them are what, working together. They're working together to keep us alive. So when you ingest a pesticide and that major community that's m making your your body work, which is, it, it's controlling your endocrine system, it's digestive, immune, mental capacity, they're all affected. And so your body is no longer resilient. And so now we're starting to understand when a guy gets non-Hodgkin's lymphoma after applying glyphosate for years and years without protection, why? What, what did it actually do to him? Because they used to say, well, you could drink this stuff, and you probably could, and not show immediate adverse effects. But ultimately, the system that you have that controls things like cancers is eroding. To me, I mean, I teach a course in environmental journalism. We use as a textbook, Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, which, well, created a revolution. It got rid of DDT in the United States. But just the other day, I was to my local hardware store, and there was, it must have been 10 feet of Roundup. I mean, shelf after shelf of Roundup. I mean, here have been all these, these successful lawsuits, and people have been awarded 
millions of dollars because they've been poisoned by Roundup. DDT was, was outlawed, but somehow Roundup and a whole array of other poisons are still around. They're still yes. being used. They're still being pushed. They're still being promoted. Like, what's wrong here that the poisoners can have their way? Well, and Perfect Earth doesn't do advocacy. So we are not look. We, you know, I thought trying to go to the government and asking them to change the laws because would be kind of the rest of my life, and, and it's not what I like. I want a garden. <laughs> so, so it we we do activism, which means we raise people's consciousness. So if people just stop buying the stuff, it's kind of done, right? Like nobody's making you buy it. Nobody's making you use it. They have very persuasive ways of suggesting and encouraging you to use it, but you don't have to. And if you're willing to have your lawn mowed a little bit higher so that there's more photosynthetic surface. And you're just talking three and a half, four inches. I'm talking three and a half to four inches. So that, so that, just think, if you, in order to have that really straight up, totally precision cut lawn, you have to cut it really short. It's just like your hair. A military cut, the moment you stop cutting it, your hair flops this way or that, and you don't look like you're in a uniform anymore. So people have stuck with this idea that their lawn should be in a uniform. And, but we don't wear uniform-like clothing anymore, so I'm not really sure you know, how we can get people to think about their lawns and landscapes the same way they think about fashion. Because fashion has moved on and landscapes have not. And I think it's marketing and because people want to that, they want their lawn to look controlled, I guess. And, but if you let it grow a little bit longer, so let's say you move from like a really short pile rug to a nice soft, deep, rug, it not only has more health in, due to more photosynthetic surface, deeper roots, more vibrancy, it crowds out the weeds because it's shading the lawn, the, the turf around it. It's shading the soil so that's healthier for the roots. There's no place for weeds to get in. The other thing that we strongly recommend is that you leave grass clippings that you, get a, that you have your lawn mowed with a mulching mower, mm. which chops the grass clippings up really fine, and, that, and let, leave them there. If you time your irrigation, so you're not mowing when the lawn is wet, you will not get big, nasty, slimy clumps, <laughs> uh, and they will be gone. On the average day, they're gone before the end of the day if you mow in the morning. If there's some places where you think, I walk there all the time, so just blow them away there. But the rest of your lawn, that's about 60% of your lawn's needs in terms of fertilizer. Because that's, because just think of the cycle. Like, all, like a tree grows up, leaves, the leaves fall down, they should go back in the soil. Grass should be the same way. Everything that a place produces should just go back into the soil. If you want to or orchestrate that somewhat so it fits your aesthetic a little better, that's what Perfect Earth is trying to help people do, is how can we make these natural cycles part of your life and your landscape's life so you don't have to import toxic or expensive or possibly foreign material from other places that uses fossil fuel, like mulch, cutting down trees. Don't send all that stuff to your landfill. 20% of our nation's landfills are, are what we call landscape waste. That, that is actually landscape food, which you, can, you own. Why not keep it? So leave your grass clippings. Also, we strongly recommend that people allow clover. If your lawn is higher, you don't see the clover except early in the spring. Clover keeps the lawn much thicker, but it fixes nitrogen. That's the really big thing with clover. So between the grass clippings and the clover, once your lawn gets established and healthy, you don't need to add anything at all. And these, these pesticide poisons, Roundup and the rest, 
not necessary at all? Well, most people use Roundup because Roundup is a 100% is a herbicide. So unless it's a woody plant, whatever it hits, it kills. So if you're using Roundup in your lawn, you're killing something and you're killing everything around it. And depending on the time of the year, most likely what you've done is just create, created a really great place for a weed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because um, your grass is never allowed to grow to seed, right? Because you're, you're cutting it right. before it goes to seed. But the weed seeds, they're everywhere. So they're coming in. So what you don't want to do is create openings in your lawn. And so... And what you do want to do is put grass seed down every fall and out-compete the weeds. If there are areas that are consistently bare or filled with weeds, then you have to look at why. So that means there's something wrong with the soil there. And continually treating it with a weed killer means that soil is getting more dead and more dead because you're killing the microbiome of the soil. How can people, viewers, avail themselves of, of, of kind of the knowledge that you've, you've collected, you've gathered, the website, perhaps you give us the URL of the website right mm -hmm. off. It's perfectearthproject.org. Lovely website. The other kind of activities that you're involved with to, to educate people, to, to raise awareness. Right, well we have a handbook which you can order online or stop by the office and get one for uh, without the postage, <laughs> but um, we're in Springs. Um, we're we, in Springs. On Springs Fireplace Road, number okay. 962. Door is okay. always open. Uh -huh. And so come by for free advice. You can call for free advice. We do charge for site visits. We have a consultation program. But you're a nonprofit. We are a nonprofit. Absolutely, a 501c3. And um, we, we assist local organizations in creating education. So we just did one with the Lake Agawam Conservancy. And there'll be another one on, um, what is that? Oh dear, I should know that by Doesn't heart. Doesn't matter the date. Yeah. But, but, but who is that with? The Lake Agawam Conservancy is a new group that was just formed because Lake Agawam is considered uh, maybe the most polluted water body in New York State. Wow. Uh, nice. <laughs> a great thing to have earned. <laughs> anyway, so, yeah, we're working with them because healthy landscapes are an important part of the Lake Agawam watershed, cleaning up the landscape. So we did a, um, a landscape awareness and invited professional landscapers, encouraging homeowners to get their landscapers to show up. We are hoping that someday all of the local municipalities will require that landscapers take the course in order to get certified to work in the, in the municipality. Um, there is a NOFA, the new, the new England Organic Farming Association right. has an organic landscaping component the Connecticut NOFA, they give courses all over the Northeast. They're for professionals, they're in depth. Uh, we will continue, we're gonna be doing one, we haven't got a date fixed yet, we'll be doing one in Bellport. Ours are just one day and more superficial, but a great way to start. And we hope to, we're, do, we're working with Sylvester Manor to create a center for landscape education. And Sylvester Manor is over in Shelter, Shelter Island. Island. Right. Yes, and that will be one out of two. There's also a place in Westchester County called Glenwood. And they're both currently historic houses with farms. And we're saying, but you have wonderful program for everything that people eat. But what have you got for what? You know, for the rest of the living world, because that's what our landscapes are. We don't see it that way. We want to kill everything that tries to eat our landscape, but it's actually not the way to um, help our ecosystem survive. That's actually causing the amazing bird and insect die off is our landscapes. Really? Yeah, that, well, you know, we lost three billion birds in North America since the 70s. Right. And that's due to loss of habitat and pesticides. That could be traced partially to agriculture, but if you look at the amount of land that is in private 
ownership, non-agricultural, so that means your landscape, your parks, homeowners associations, hospitals, school campuses, business parks, those pl are the places that if we changed our practices, we could actually restore the bird population ourselves. Mm -hmm. Because they're all connected, they create corridors. Birds need 70% of their range to be native plants. So that's the next thing the Perfect Earth is doing. We're starting an initiative called Two Thirds for the Birds. And we're asking everyone to plant two out of three native plants. You don't have to rip out what's there unless it's invasive, but just start loading up your gardens with native plants and stop using pesticides. And we really could turn the bird loss around. I didn't have a single cardinal at my feeder this winter. It's painful because you always think, oh, that's happening somewhere else. That sounds bad, but it's not immediate. And this winter, the I mean, I, I only use one bag of feed. Usually I'll go through four or five. They're, they're just not there. My birds are not there. And I, I, I kind of feel like crying every time I think of it. It's really, it's like happening because our landscapes are food deserts. There's nothing there. And every little nibble on a leaf, people spray. And if, and, and, a chickadee needs six to 9,000 caterpillars to feed one nest of young. Mm -hmm. Do you think you have six to 9,000 caterpillars on your property for one little chickadee nest? Not if you spray. Edwina Von Gaal and the Perfect Earth Project trying to get the earth back to being perfect. You've been watching Environment Long Island. I'm Carl Grossman. Thanks for watching. Thank you.